Okay, welcome everyone. The guests here in the house, in the Bali, first time since two and a half months, and those of you who are watching from home, I hope everybody is safe. Uh, this is the first episode of a series of three. It's called um, The Many Faces of Modern China. And in three uh, uh, different uh, stages, we hope to deal with the main aspects of China, and we do it in a, in a way that it is a kind of reality check. Uh, it's of China's economy, its political system, and the rise of China on the international stage. Originally, we have been talking about this way back last fall. So given the new circumstances with the coronavirus, we decided to put as much coronavirus in our content as is allowed by the various governments. Tonight, we'll talk about the, uh, China's economic miracle. What is the key to understanding China's economy? And will these main features of the Chinese economy also help to shape up the recovery of China in the post-corona era? My name is Lili Sprangers. I'm the manager of the Leiden Asia Center, and I will moderate this evening, just in case you are thinking, what is this woman doing here? Uh, we have three speakers. Two of them are physically present, Valerie Hooks and Stephen Peterman. Uh, my colleague from Leiden, Dr. Wang Jue, is online, and she will come in any moment. We've tested it, so that's working OK. After we had um, the presentations and a short discussion among the speakers, we will go for the Q&A session. That is perhaps where I, you are tuned in in the first place. The Q&A session, as Sarah just told you, will be done by Slido.com. And it's an automatic generating system that will prioritize the questions that you have. So the most popular questions will pop up. So I encourage both those here in the room also behind my back, and those at home to make use of this uh, nice uh, technology. Um, good. Um, and at the same time, I should warn you, it may be the case that not all the questions that you will pose will be able to be dealt with, dealt with because we have learned that the attention span of people online is limited to a mere 15 minutes. So we'll try to hurry a little bit. Nevertheless, a short introduction in this very particular session on China's economy. Uh, when back in 1978, uh, Deng Xiaoping took over the, uh, one of the first of three major functions at the helm of the People's Republic, the country's economy was a mixture of a centrally planned industrial economy with a collectivized but very impoverished agricultural sector that had to feed a fast-growing number of households. While 70% of the workforce was employed in this, in this sector, it only accounted for 37% of the GDP. Uh, within the next 40 years, between 1978 and 2018, China managed against all odds to become the number two economy, economic power globally, thereby threatening the position of the United States who held that position for over a century. And if we are to believe the figures published last Friday in The Guardian, according to our latest World Bank report, they already took over, in terms of GDP, the leading position as the biggest economy in the world. Now, how did this come about? What are the key factors of this unparalleled success? And how did this affect the life of more than 1.3 billion Chinese citizens? We will kick off with a lecture on exactly that by my colleague, Dr. Wang Jue, who was born in Ningbo, which I assumed was in Wales, but she told me that was in China, and is currently Associate Professor of Chinese Economy and International Political Economy at the Leiden University Institute for Area Studies. Hi, Jue. She received her education at Warwick University, where she finished her PhD in 2014 before coming to Leiden. Currently, she's working on the role of China in the multilateral financial and economic international organizations, and she's about to finish at Chesenham Leiden Asia Center on that topic. Jue, I really have to move my chair a bit so I can see you. I know exactly what you look like, but you look, you look good. Welcome to this session. The technique is working okay, which is fine. Uh, and I would start off with a somewhat personal question to you. You were born in the mid 80s. Uh, so around the time that the Chinese economy was really booming, you were about 10 years old. Can you remember the changes this enormous growth brought to uh, Ningbo and to your personal life? That's a very good calculation of my, my age. Um, also, that brings a vivid memory. So my visual memory about uh, 
um, uh, from early 90s to mid 90s was the broadened roads, um, uh, new bridges, uh, new highways, and also rising skyscrapers. I remember it was a big deal uh, to have buildings above 30 uh, floors. I remember when, a very, when I was a very small child, there was only one shopping mall in which there was escalator. So it was actually an entertainment um, for parents to bring kids to take that escalator up and down. But then uh, later on, uh, you saw more and more uh, high buildings, and now you see uh, some of the highest building in the world uh, in China. And another memory was I remember um, grown-ups were talking about the better, the best jobs for university graduates was in the trade sector, at, at least in my city, because my city is a um, in the coastal area, it is a very trade-oriented uh, oriented city. We, had, we have a big harbor, which has a, a very close link with the, the, the harbor in uh, Rotterdam, actually. So um, that was like the best job in the, in the trade companies, like, uh, like financial service jobs uh, nowadays or, or the jobs in the, the best uh, top IT companies. So th those were the two memories that I can think of right now. Okay, okay, thanks for sharing. And now we go to the more academic uh, part of your uh, lecture. Uh, I'm supposed to work the slides, so I hope that works well, because you will actually now more or less disappear from the screen and we will see your slides. And if I'm not doing it correctly, just let me know. Yeah? Okay, yeah. great. Start. Okay. So um, thank you, thanks for everyone uh, being there. I'm sorry I can't be there physically, but I hope this uh, will have similar um, effects. So what I'm going to do uh, today is I will quickly go through China's economic growth model, growth pattern, highlighting both the strengths and the challenges China is facing at the moment. And hopefully that will provide the context for further discussion um, of the impact of COVID-19 that I know my fellow uh, panelists will elaborate, elaborate on later. So, I will have three focuses. First of all, I will quickly um, introduce the trajectory of China's economic growth since the uh, late 1970s. And then I will highlight three key features of China's growth model, which reflect both strengths and uh, challenges of the Chinese economy. And um, at, uh, at last, I will conclude by exploring um, the future opportunities as well as uh, challenges for the Chinese economy in the uh, near future. So without further ado, let me start from describing the um, uh, trajectory of China's economic development since, uh, um, since, since the late 1970s. So you are probably quite familiar with the story of China's rapid economic growth, right? Uh, seeing that J-curve, um, you wouldn't be surprised that since the 1980s, you start to see China's GDP um, value increase very um, uh, rapidly, especially um, in, the, um, uh, uh, in the past 20 years. However, what you are less familiar with is China's economic growth trajectory, which is the next graph I want to show to you. If you look at this graph, you see a lot of zigzags. So this is a graph of China's annual GDP growth rate every year since 1975 to 2018. You will see that in some years, the GDP was growing much faster in some other years. In some cases, some extreme cases, you would also see Chinese economy was growing very fast. And then um, the GDP growth rate dropped um, dr dramatically the next year. And then it went back again after a short while. So this kind of up and down shows a very complicated policy changes behind China's uh, um, uh, GDP growth. Uh, you would see that in the 1980s, there were quite a lot of uh, zigzags, which shows the uh, frequent policy changes, as well as the political competition between the reformist leaders and the more conservative leaders. 
And uh, if you look in the uh, 19, uh, uh, 1990s, uh, especially since 1992, um, those who are more familiar with Chinese economy uh, know that um, in that decade, the 1990s, China went through a whole series of uh, uh, liberalization, uh, liberal economic reforms, especially towards the late, latest years, the late 1990s, China went through very radical reforms in the uh, state-owned enterprises. Um, and since then, you also saw um, China's economy started to grow very fast, especially after 2001, uh, when China joined the WTO. So between 2001 and 2007, you saw Chinese economy was going up very fast. That was also the period uh, we believe Chinese economy was very much driven by the export, the increase of export. But then, unfortunately, the the um, uh, go the upward. Um, trajectory was dragging down by the global financial crisis. And in fact, in the past 10 years, Chinese economy has continued to slow down. And in the most recent years, it has been um, affected by uh, both domestic and external um, uh, events, for example, the China-U.S. trade war uh, and the most recent uh, COVID-19 crisis will likely drag down China's uh, growth even further. I've seen a prediction of uh, um, this year's annual GDP growth rate ranging from 1.2% to 3.6%. So no matter which point on that spectrum, uh, we will very likely see the slowest annual GDP growth since the 1970s. So, so that was the, 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 the main uh, trajectory, um, very brief, but hopefully give you an, an overview. But then what does it mean? What is China's uh, um, economic development model? Huh? What are the key features? So I will point out three key features state-guided, investment-driven, and export-led. So these three key features contributed to fast growth, uh, especially in the first 30 years so since 1978, but they are also associated with some of the deeply embedded problems in the Chinese economy. So first uh, feature, first uh, key feature of Chinese economic growth model is state-guided. As we know that uh, Chinese economy is very state-guided. The state plays a crucial in the, um, in the economy. Although the state government has delegated some of the economic decision-making to the local level, but it still um, has the authority in economic legislation, in making uh, general uh, uh, economic strategies, in uh, monetary fiscal policies, also coordinating economic uh, transactions among different provinces or appointing the key economic officials. So the state still plays a very important role as well as the state-owned enterprises. So there are both advantages and disadvantages of a growth model like this. On the plus side, a growth model like that allows um, long-term planning, uh, which is different from uh, some of the Western economies. And also this shows the state has very strong capacity in allocating resources for infrastructure construction and development projects, which has been a key reason of China's fast growth in the past uh, four decades. And also these SOEs work as powerful economic vehicles that lead the production and the service in several key sectors, such as energy, transportation, telecommunication, uh, or high-tech uh, sectors like AI and robotic, uh, space uh, engineering, etc. And also these SOEs are primary actors of China's overseas economic expansion, for example, in the uh, very famous uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, projects. Um, and what also makes China's uh, SOE, um, state-owned enterprise, um, special is Chinese SOEs have... Uh, particular social responsibility to fulfill. For example, during the COVID um, period, in the first uh, uh, three months um, of this year, the Chinese government actually rely on the state of enterprises to maintain the production of some key medical equipment for the health system during the spring festival, the spring festival when most of the private companies were closed for the, uh, for the festival. 
But of course, on the other hand, we know that state-owned enterprises are known for uh, uh, being less profitable, less efficient. They also accumulate a much higher debt because it's much easier for them to borrow money from state-owned uh, banks in China. Um, and also the state, the, the state-owned enterprises that have a controversial role in the high-tech sector. On the, on the one hand, um, these uh, state-owned enterprises play an important role in high-tech development, which allows the state to shape the direction of uh, high-tech development. But on the other hand, a lot of uh, analysts also point out that we cannot rely on state companies to come up with the most radical uh, and cutting-edge innovation. Because it's just uh, um, because this innovation comes from um, most innovative private uh, companies, which more follow the market rules. And the last but not least, the, the state of enterprises also, when they are uh, operating abroad, they also criticize the for um, having uh, lacking transparency or having too much uh, government intervention. Um, in their business operations. So these are the advantage and disadvantage of the first key, key feature. The second key feature of China's ec uh, economic development model is called uh, investment driven. So if you look at the graph, this graph shows the um, portion, proportion of gross fixed capital formation in the GDP. So this is the index of the importance of investment in, dri in driving the economy. You will see that China's uh, gross fixed capital formation uh, to GDP rate is much higher than its East Asian neighbors, as well as uh, uh, OECD and world average. So China is a very much investment-driven economy. Again, there's a pro and a con. Eh? On the positive side, um, this kind of uh, model ensures rapid growth in a very short period, and it also satisfies the Chinese government's ambitious development goals. But on the other hand, this kind of a development model relies on a very rigid state-run financial system that channels uh, uh, saving of the household to the companies to become investment capital at a very low cost. So what does that mean? That means um, it generates rather low financial rewards for the households. And in addition to that, the capital and energy intensive productions also often generate a serious uh, environmental side effects. And last but not least, um, this kind of investment driven model generates more rewards for the capital and the asset owners instead of ordinary consumers, which exacerbates the social, inequality, social inequality in the Chinese society. So that's the second key factor. The third key factor, I would call it uh, um, export-led, uh, especially, in the in the especially in the first 30 years of uh, Chinese economic development since, uh, since the late 1970s. So this is, on this graph, you can see that um, especially after 2001, the proportion of export in China's GDP increased to a very high level above 35%, which is much higher than the world average. But then it started to decline since the um, global financial crisis. But considering how big Chinese economy is, still the export plays a very important role in the world economy. And also, you know China as the world's uh, manufacturing center. Right? So China is a very much um, export-oriented economy, at least at this moment. The government has been talking about, no, we cannot rely on uh, export forever. Uh, uh, we need to develop a domestic market, but still export is a very important part. Then again, there are advantage and disadvantage of, of this kind of a model. On the one hand, it efficiently utilizes China's comparative advantage, which is a large scale of low-cost labor force. It, and also because the, um, uh, the export sector is very much relying on the FDI. The FDI brings a lot of advanced management skills and uh, technology, so that's good for the economy, good for the labor force, and it, it also incorporates China into the global supply chain, make China an um, important part of the international trade system. But on the other hand, it also makes China uh, overly dependent on the external market. So we have seen that 
after the global financial crisis or after uh, the U.S., the, the Trump administration punished the Chinese exports. And also during this COVID-19 crisis, we see that as the external markets uh, weaken, um, it will uh, very likely drag down China's export. And also the, the environmental cost of a energy intensive low tech manufacturing sector is also relatively high. So um, what does it say about the future? Uh, so based on these uh, um, strengths and the challenges, uh, what can we expect for Chinese economy um, in the near future? So I will conclude on that. Of course, that brings, uh, the we still see a lot of uh, opportunities in the Chinese economy, right? You see, there are great potential in the service sector, uh, and also China has a huge domestic market. Um, and the, the Chinese companies and government has great incentive in industrial upgrading based on uh, high-tech development, which is especially important for China um, during this period when China's uh, relationship with the U.S. Uh, worsens and when China uh, enters a period of technological competition with, uh, with the United States of America. And also China um, uh, plans to invest a lot in new infrastructure, which again depends on uh, high technology. And also China is exploring a lot of opportunities of international cooperation. But then on the other hand, China also faces uh, massive challenges. For example, how can the government push for the reform of uh, uh, state-owned enterprises and make them uh, more profitable and efficient? How does the Chinese government manage financial risks and the rising debt? And uh, now we know that the government has eased uh, monetary policy even further in order to rescue the economy from the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, will this kind of eased um, monetary policy um, uh, push pushed up the debt level even further. Uh, and also, um, how will Chinese government uh, improve its social safety nets for the low-skill laborers, uh, for the low-tech um, manufacturing uh, laborers when, when the government is calling for high technology? But what do they do with the, the low-skill laborers? They need uh, um, uh, better um, public goods to ensure uh, their basic um, uh, uh, life standard. And also China uh, needs to continue to improve its institutions, um, its, its political institutions, its legal system, make sure the policy procedures are transparent and also need to reduce the corrupt corruption level. And externally, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the relationship with the U.S. is uh, entering a very difficult period of time and that affects Chinese economy and uh, also China's influence in the international political society. And China also faces a lot of risks in the international projects. Uh, under the Belt and Road Initiative, some of these projects uh, are facing um, big risks. And uh, last but not least, uh, and in the most immediate future, how will China really implement all these uh, um, fiscal and policy, um, fiscal and monetary policies that uh, Premier Li Keqiang announced last week um, at the uh, 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 Congress meeting, National Congress meeting, to rescue Chinese economy from the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So I believe my fellow um, panelists will continue with the. Um, with more details of COVID-19 uh, later. But uh, I want to end here and remind you that at this moment, the Chinese uh, government and the company's focus is very much um, domestically how the economy can recover from the current pandemic crisis. So I will stop there. Well, thank you very much indeed for a, quite a comprehensive overview of the world's maybe most complicated economy over the past 40 years. Uh, I'm quite sure there are people in the room here who uh, do not really uh, uh, heard all those terms before, but that can come in the Q&A, but I think it's a really nice basis for our discussion. Now, you were finishing when, in stressing the domestic emphasis for now, for getting the economy back on track. Mm. But at the same time, in your presentation, and also the key features of the Turkish economy, especially the export-led, and the dependence of foreign direct investment, and the role of SOE, and the enormous growth right after, the decade after they joined to WTO in 2001, uh, it is clear that China in the end will not recover without, uh, cannot recover, uh, but 
with this international or economic orientation it has had over the past 20 years. Uh, would that explain to a certain extent the incredible diplomatic efforts that have been put forward over the past few weeks, past few months in displaying and playing the role as the one nation that had already fixed the corona crisis and helping out others. I mean, how important is this international dimension for China in the short, but also in the long run? That's an excellent question because, uh, again, COVID-19 has become a worldwide uh, crisis, right? Crisis. Health it started as a health um, crisis. Now it has a uh, turning it towards the uh, direction of economic crisis. So for a country like China, which is uh, um, widely connected to the rest of the world, how external markets uh, react and how um, European markets uh, Asian market, the U.S. market reacts to um, China is very much important. So if you look at what happened in China in the first just three months, um, China's export um, uh, uh, decreased a lot, mostly because the factories were stopping uh, producing uh, products. Um, because of the, the pandemic. Um, I, I ordered some um, furniture in January here from the Netherlands, and they usually promise to uh, uh, deliver in five weeks. I, I checked, it's, it's a German company, and they will deliver five weeks, but I just received it today. So I, I figured that maybe the, 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 whatever I ordered, the furniture was produced in China, and this long delay was because the factories were closed down. And now they finally, these Chinese companies have finally started to uh, produce again. They are facing the problem of external markets is uh, weakening. European markets are weakening, US markets are uh, weakening. If the markets are not buying enough Chinese goods, that's a big problem for the Chinese producers. Um, but if you look at the trade data, you would see that um, China's trade with ASEAN countries and other Asian uh, neighbors have actually not decreased that much compared to the European and the U.S. market. This encourages Chinese government to um, further strengthen the relationship with its Asian neighbors and uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, not necessar necessarily as an alternative to the European and the U.S. market, but also as a you know, a complementary, a bigger market a destination. So I think now it's very important for the Chinese government. And that also explains all the diplomatic effort it, it, um, it made. First of all, to ensure uh, its partners that the Chinese economy will recover. It is running. We're trying our best. But on the other hand, also China needs to smoothen the diplomatic relationship with uh, uh, foreign countries, especially with the U.S. and the European countries, to make sure the uh, business will uh, recover uh, in the medium run. Okay, good. Thank you very much. We had uh, initially planned to talk a little bit longer, but given the time restraints, and they are huge and massive here at the table, I can tell you, and also in the room, and especially for the people back home who already have looked at the TV guide, what the next program will be. So we really have to stay in time, but you will stay connected um, while I'll start talking with uh, Valerie and Stephen here around the sure, table. Thank sure. you very much indeed. Okay, thank you. Stefan, this is for you. It's the remote control. Yes. Oh, this is this is one meter. This is one meter fifty. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we check that. We check that. Good. You have that here. Okay. Good. Um, Valerie, yeah. uh, let me introduce you. You are a Dutch sinologist, and you have been active in China since two thousand. 2000, yes, it's 20 exactly. years you yes. have been active in China in various capacity, but always looking at the business side. And in 2010, you decided to found your own company together with other people, which is China Inroads, uh, in which you have become a specialist as a consultant um, in consulting, advising yeah. uh, high level boards of both Dutch companies who do business in Chinese companies yes. and Chinese companies that want to do business in Europe. Okay. Um, you are in touch with a large group of uh, all kinds of business people, manufacturers and all kinds of other people. So we, uh, we uh, ask you to write an article for our website and then uh, this came up. So we now want to discuss with you yes. on how Chinese 
companies are reacting, especially to the corona crisis. I mean, Joy has picture to sketch the big picture, but now we're going into things that happened somewhere in between December and in January. Could you give us, again, the time constraint, a concise description of the situation in China seen through the eyes of Chinese business people? Yes. Uh, thank you, Lily. Um, well, I must say that um, I'm speaking with my Chinese business partners on a daily basis, and I feel now, just the past two weeks, uh, people are really uh, back on track. Uh, but if I um, look back one month or maybe two months, uh, there was still a lot of fear. So although travel bans were lifted and people were allowed to travel, people just didn't dare to sit on a plane or, or take a bus uh, because of the fear of being infected. Um, and that was a big hassle because in, in Chinese culture you need to have face-to-face -face contact if you want to establish new contacts for business. Um, and they, most Chinese have a, a starting point of distrust when, when meeting each other. So you really have to put a lot of effort in that part. So what I experienced is that um, there was a lot of delay in, in many projects, um, especially when it concerned new projects. So the running business is still ongoing, and I experienced the same issues myself. Uh, but when you have to establish new contact with Chinese people, they, uh, they had trouble doing so. Uh, but now it seems uh, the, the level of, of business activity is getting back to, to normal. We're now on 60% level of domestic flights um, compared to the pre-epidemic phase. Um, but I think, um, uh, yeah, this will take some more time before it's really fully recovered. Yeah. Last week we've seen the, uh, the annual uh, People Congress uh, coming together. Yes. Uh, that all the measures around uh, uh, Corona, COVID-19 must have played a large role. Yeah. How guiding is, the, is, is this gathering? What, what is the importance of it? Um, I think it's it's very guiding, uh, like uh, Jay already uh, explained. Um, uh, basically, you have the uh, government um, pointing out the direction where the, the country is going. And uh, if I look at um, what my business partners are doing, is they were anxiously waiting for this week to come. So prior to that week, not only for uh, uh, they had to wait for the output uh, of, uh, for example, new investments in certain industries, but also the officials were really, um, um, well, focused on this meeting. So uh, just to give you a tangible example, there uh, is a business partner who is in waste treatment technology and he wanted to set up a new project and he needed local funding from the government. Um, so now um, it is clear that the environmental protection is still on the agenda of the Chinese uh, um, economic targets, so he can get uh, he can get the green light for for this investment. So only now they can proceed, and that does apply to state-owned enterprise and non-state-owned enterprise yes. alike. Yes, and I feel that um, um, I'm in my segment. I'm mostly active in uh, in machinery for uh, waste treatment, for food sorting, environmental technology, um, and these are all areas that are very highly on the agenda of the of the Chinese government. But um, I must say that there's also another trend um, because, as Jay already showed, um, the GDP has dropped tremendously in the first quarter of this year uh, by 6.8 percent, which is which didn't happen. We saw that um, since 76 when Mao Zedong passed away. So um, they didn't set a new target this year. And deliberately. Um, the, sorry? Deliberately. Yes, yeah. um, because the, it seems the focus seems to shift. So I feel that COVID has also accelerated the normalization of the market. And that is what I also experienced over the past decade that I've been involved in such businesses. You know, at the start, uh, in 2008, 10, um, there was, everything was possible. Investors uh, were very easy to find. People would uh, get money for their projects and they would, um, well, every, every businessman had opportunities. And now um, um, we have to work very hard, also with our foreign technologies, to prove that we need investment from the local governments. And we have delegations coming in, not at this very moment, of course, but uh, delegations from China coming into the Netherlands. And we really have to show them everything, like why are we, is our technology better than the local um, alternative? Yeah. On that particular point, uh, there is a lot of talk in Europe that we have become too dependent, not only from China, but also from India, yeah. and that we may have to refer to more local production. Is that something that you see in China as well? 
Uh, yes, it's quite interesting actually because you see, uh, well, Trump has the decoupling strategy um, uh, going on at this very moment. Um, and you see that uh, China, at least my business partners, are realizing that they're actually also quite dependent on their European strategic uh, partners uh, because they are delivering not only the machines, I mean, a lot can be outsourced to local, locally in China, but the core technology remains in the hand of the, of the European businesses. And I have, for example, um, a businessman importer uh, of uh, European food sorting machinery, all kinds of different types, and 80% uh, of his projects were postponed because the machines had to come from uh, Italy and Spain, and, well, they were in lockdown. Um, so I sense that, um, uh, that, that this COVID phase uh, accelerates the need for the Chinese people to, to, to localize basically their uh, production as well. As much as possible. Well, they have already the, the intention that is also that was just shared also in the annual meeting again that how China wants to become the innovative global leader and this is part of it. So they want to uh, make sure that innovation comes from China and is not imported from other countries yeah. anymore. Is there anything that we could learn from China as we are starting up our economy later, presumably? Yes. Well. Um, in nature, Chinese people are, and that is something that, that really attracts me when being in China, the Chinese people are very agile, um, uh, but they still have a very vivid long-term goal. And that is not only the, the, the government now pinpointing like 2030 global innovative leader, uh, but also businessmen. They have a very opportunistic goal, uh, but the road towards that goal is very dynamic. So they know how to uh, kind of, uh, well, be agile, be flexible, and make sure that they overcome the burdens. So in Chinese, you say, uh, take a step back in order to be able to proceed. And I feel that a lot of people um, uh, look at COVID as a huge setback, uh, but they even, um, well, make the best out of it. And maybe one example to illustrate this, um, a businessman I'm working with a lot, he's a great runner, um, and his uh, company uh, celebrated the 16th anniversary. Normally, he would throw a big party, um, but now he was in quarantine in a hotel room. So he started running 16 kilometers from door to window and back, and he uh, recorded this. And this is, to me, just a very small example of how Chinese people can deal with, with problems. First of all, he overcomes his frustrations, right? But he also uh, uses this to kind of market his company as a CEO, and this went viral. So uh, that is what I love about the Chinese people. Okay, okay, good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, one more question. It, it may be a reset for a lot of people, but it's obvious that also China has groups that are really suffering from what is happening right now in yes. terms of economic breakdown. What, what would be the group that you would ask attention for especially? Yes. Well, I think one of the um, most important uh, things now is the unemployment rate, which is increasing. We're now up to 6% instead of 5.5 last year. But within that percentage, uh, they did not calculate the 300 million migrant workers throughout China. 300 million? Yes. And they expect that up to 70 million are basically, um, uh, well, lost their jobs. Uh, and it's difficult to uh, record because they have no official contracts, they have no social insurance. And these are domestic workers. Yes, and yeah. uh, they, most of them were in lockdown, um, so uh, they are trying to get back on track. But as the manufacturers only, I think the capacity is now back to 80%. But a lot of manufacturers, um, you know, don't hire the people anymore, or they're afraid of the people who are coming from the Wuhan area. They're not where, you know, where mm -hmm. it originated, so they're not welcomed. Um, and those people are replaceable, most of them. So uh, it is. They have. Uh, I think they are hit hardest. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. The topic will come back in Stephen's uh, talk. Uh, no uh, doubt. Thank you very much. Uh, we now turn to our last speaker, Stephen Petterman, who studied the history of architecture at the Utrecht University, and then he also wanted to become an architect, and he learned that at the Technical University in Eindhoven. Uh, you're a visiting professor of the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, um, and together with Rem Koolhaas, you have been working on a number of uh, rural projects, let's put it that way, with an emphasis on uh, 
innovation. And contrary to what you may find on the internet, uh, Stephen Petterman does not play football for the Dallas Cowboys. That was my first entry when I googled your name. Wow. But, uh, I was, my God, what are we into? But that is, uh, that is not, that is, there, there are many people called Stephen Petterman, actually, but this yeah. was the one I found first. Okay, uh, Stephen, you have designed, made a PowerPoint presentation, yes. a short PowerPoint present presentation, with, which will help you to tell the story that you want yes. to convey to us. Please yes. go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Lili and Zara. Uh, uh, just some brief words just about my context and what I've been doing in China, just to give everybody a bit of a taste of also what China looks like, feels like. Um, this is a project we've been doing uh, together with the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, uh, Rem and me, uh, while doing a bigger project that, that was shown at the Guggenheim uh, Museum in New York. Uh, at, at, actually, right at this moment, should be open, but obviously it's closed, and we're hoping it reopens soon at the Guggenheim. And we wanted to give Americans a bit of a glimpse of what China looks like. Hey. Ah, yeah, here. Um, just some footage like uh, trying to explore this vast, vast territory that is the countryside, trying to illustrate to an American audience a bit of, um, yeah, of its complexity, um, of its history. So here you see some footage of how the Chinese are currently um, developing all kinds of new technologies, new um, developments in energy, uh, in uh, tourism, in agriculture. Also, here is the dramatic changes of, uh, of Taobao and uh, economic revolutions, which Jay so beautifully uh, s like gave this very big picture of, like on a let's say on a economic level how it looks like, but then also how it kind of responds to in the uh, on the local level. Um, now these are just some responses just after the opening. Uh, of the exhibition. Yeah, these are the themes we've been looking at. So what is this future? How is this large, vast area that is outside of the urban perimeters where we normally have our image of China made up out of enormous skylines and these skyrocketing Shanghai and, and other and Beijing uh, uh, visions that we normally get? What is this country's uh, future? And just to show a bit, a few like, small parts of the content, we try to first of all give Americans a sense of the scale of the country. It's actually almost exactly the same size, almost to a few square kilometers, uh, exactly proportionate. But also, like uh, huge differences. Obviously, if you compare it to the 70s, uh, uh, lots have changed. Ja, uh, beautifully illustrated that these are two maps trying to f show Americans that basically where China didn't have that much uh, passenger rail in the 70s, it now has the most advanced, fastest network of, uh, of uh, rail infrastructure where the American one has uh, suffered considerably. Um, it's also a very different economy that is developing. Uh, we looked a lot at e-commerce and uh, how e-commerce platforms differ from the American model. For example, these are, this is by a student um, showing the difference between how Chinese countryside, um, let's say, e-commerce is structured and how Amazon is doing it. So you don't see a lot of these vast, uh, huge warehouses, but it's much more decentralized and much more up to the local uh, local commerce uh, um, areas. And lastly, I wanted to show just another small snippet. We also have a large section where we try to explain actually all these power levels in the Chinese state. And obviously, the, the American audience probably thinks that Xi Jinping runs everything, but obviously want to kind of give a bit of a context in terms of how, how power is layered and structured in society, how there's all of these different areas, which uh, uh, Valerie pointed out, that there's huge dynamics inside of a country which you don't normally see, uh, and that it's not just one monotonous a body of, uh, of land mass. And one of the most innovative countries I think I've found, which is really uh, fascinating, was a, a, a rural channel to Taobao Live, where you are basically connected by with your smartphone directly to a farmer uh, in the countryside picking apples. And you can point and say, look, I want that apple, that apple, and that apple. You put it in a box, they ship it to uh, Beijing, and the next day you have it refrigerated. And like a bit of a like as a, as, a, as a Tinder for shopping, you can also swipe it to the to the left, mm. and then you'll get a butcher in Hunan where you can sort of select sausages that you like, and the same support your locals. 
Exactly, yeah. but then on but a then vast, on a wide scale. <laughs> vast scale, this is not some some fringe product. This is really yeah. large scale uh, development of this of the largest platform that you see, and obviously it has a tremendous effect in the countryside of how you structure your life. We had a lot of contact with also young people who indeed are fed up also partially with the factory lives. Uh, so some of them obviously are very much hurt by by the COVID nineteen crisis, but some of them hopefully it also gives an opportunity to actually to return to the countryside to needs look at this domestic market which is growing like uh, tourism uh, before uh, COVID was exploding in China like uh, like walking and hiking was like uh, totally the thing to do uh, you, you saw a lot of investment also in the countryside to develop new forms of uh, living together with farmers or like having workshops uh, cooking classes all of these type of uh, new economies were popping up everywhere and uh, yeah I hope that uh, partially that accelerates and that uh, this urban rural balance gets uh, gets struck which the government has been very set on uh, establishing so that's my my brief few notes okay okay thank you very very well since you're so acquainted with the uh, rural uh, area with the countryside could I ask you uh, we've seen these impressive growth figures uh, uh, by uh, Joey uh, did the urban area and the mega cities profit to the same extent from this e economic growth of the past 40 years um, there is still a big difference between the countryside in terms of income uh, and the distribution of wealth. Um, I visited the last living commune that's still uh, obey, like functioning through the, uh, the Maoist rules from the 50s and in the countryside uh, called Lujuang uh, and there life was good but life in the city is better. Mm. So there's been a lot of improvements uh, and life is pretty good uh, in much of the countryside. Also there's still obviously there's still the, the last poverty alleviation projects that is the first round of basically the government's ambitions by 2020 to uh, fully get rid of uh, poverty in China which they were set on achieving this year, but I think they announced that they will not be able to fulfill this promise. But you, so you see uh, a lot of also really beautiful countryside, like at one point I remember I was in one of these high-speed trains and it was one of the uh, German ICE looking trains. And I fell asleep and I opened my eyes and it looked just like Bavaria. Uh, and uh, the train looked German, so I thought, what, what happened? How did I get <laughs> from the middle of China into, uh, into Bavaria? Uh, but then saw the Chinese uh, characters everywhere. I thought, oh, yeah, no, 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 I'm, I'm really in China. So that, yeah, it's a huge country with uh, also very high level developed uh, uh, and also prosperous areas. And, uh, also some areas that, that still need a lot of attention. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, uh, yes, you can may do, I, yeah, yeah, you may, you may, but I'm getting all kind of signals that sure. I, uh, the time, time constraints yeah. on me are incredible. Uh, but please do react. Well, I, maybe from the, uh, the, the city perspective, because unfortunately I would say I'm mostly uh, spending time in the cities, uh, I experience a lot of, I hear a lot of stories from my uh, business people, friends also, who actually want to move out of the cities because of the high cost in the, in the cities, but also the huge competition, uh, not only in, in the working field, but also for their children to perform well in school. And I think it may be even a trend that people are, um, well, not maybe go to the real countryside, but to go to the second, third, fourth tier cities to, to have a more relaxed life. To yeah. escape the red race yes. of Beijing, Shanghai, yeah. Chongqing and the like. Okay. And also a, an older and a younger generation which have uh, very different views of life and where they want to go to. I'm not quite sure whether that was on the agenda of the National People Congress to, uh, this uh, the past few weeks. No, but they, they did keep their promise, and I don't know if it's, it's, uh, if it's um, realistic, but they did keep their promise to eliminate extreme poverty by the end of 2020. Uh, but I'm, I'm quite skeptical because the econ economy is slowing down, obviously. Um, and uh, uh, Li, uh, Li Keqiang even said he wants to create like nine... Uh, million jobs in urban areas and I think again there uh, the migrant workers will be left out uh, because focus is on innovation and they need 
highly skilled and educated people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On innovation, one more question. Could you name an example of innovation that had a rural basis, uh, which is helping uh, to overcome corona or has an application function of any kind that is really attached to the rural uh, area? Uh, for COVID-19, I've been asking around also to farmers and to all kinds of people I've met on, along the way. And there you see that uh, for, the, uh, for the farmers themselves, there's not much change. Also, they were a vital part of industry and uh, the Shoguang area uh, farmers, they just kept on uh, continuing their jobs, their work. Uh, I think in the e-commerce sector, it really accelerated like to even uh, further develop uh, the online platforms uh, to to an email, even more seamless integration into uh, into life and into uh, making sure that all the, the the whole value chain kind of kept going uh, and I think that's a, quite a feat of uh, ingenuity how they managed to keep everything sort of flowing and probably that is uh, again due to this uh, more decentralized uh, use of internet and also uh, digital technology. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm afraid I have to leave it like this here because now we turn to the questions. There are many questions popping up, uh, but I also wanted to give the opportunity to the people who, are, are, who took the trouble of coming all the way to the Bali and if they use the public transport with a mondkapje, uh, so their freedom of speech can no longer be uh, contained. Um, is there anything that you would like to ask? I have one person here. Please go ahead. Oh yeah, Sarah will bring the microphone. Otherwise the people back home will not have it. It's a stretched microphone, nice. My question would be... Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My question would be uh, to our, uh, to the lady of uh, Leiden. Yeah. Joe, you're still with us? Yes. Okay. Good. Yes, okay. <clears throat> so to explain the, the so I, I'm working for 30 years now in Brazil, but I was born here. Um, but in Brazil, when we discuss uh, China, we, of course, the, the frame is catch up. Uh, how does a developing country, you know, get on top of technological? So it's not just about exports, state-led investment. Um, one other issue uh, that I would like you to, to discuss a little bit is the foreign direct investments, how you deal with them. Because if you look at the investments of multinational companies, they were everywhere. In fact, in percentage of the economy, it's higher in Brazil than in China. However, China managed to force the multinational companies technological transfer, right? Joint ventures, uh, well, there are a lot of things in which exactly these things are now questions by those who were on top, Europe and the United States, because they don't want to, you know, they want to stay alone on the top. And the other third world countries, like Brazil and many others, are looking like China. Wow, how did they do that? They're open to foreign direct investment, and they took their technology, and they, you know, they managed to become themselves leader in technology. And that is something which is really interesting. Because if you look at Japan and South Korea, they set up from the start their own companies. Yeah, it's different. China just opened to multinational companies like Malaysia did, like Brazil did. Like, but all the others did not manage to get the technology out of these companies and to develop their own uh, strength in technology. And that is threatening. Not, not export and state and investment. That threatening is China becoming leader in technology. And that's also the example of third world countries. Therefore, there's so much interest and respect for the Chinese example. Yeah, okay, thank you for the question. Jane. Yeah, okay, so I will, uh, with the time uh, in con concern, I will... Uh, and you have to uh, be brief, uh, huh? Also, yeah, brief. So uh, you raise a very important point. Uh, yes, Ch the, the reason China uh, increased is not, of course, because, not because of money, not because just uh, the capital or the export. It is technology. Yes, it is very much. And eventually, it is the technology that decides how sustainable a country's development is. And that's why the Chinese government um, is so uh, concerned with the high tech development with all these uh, um, uh, technology development, especially now that uh, it faces difficulty because of the uh, rivalry with the U.S., the U.S. Are trying to cut China off um, the global, global uh, network of uh, uh, technological innovation and China 
is frustrated. Uh, on the one hand, China develops uh, in indigenously, and on the other hand, China also wants to maintain, uh, really makes extra effort to maintain the collaboration with Europeans, with Asians. Um, Yes, tech, first of all, I totally agree technology is key. And uh, you, you mentioned um, one um, uh, characteristic about China's FDI is China managed, the, the Chinese administration managed to um, convince these co companies transfer their technology to China. How did China manage? I think uh, because uh, uh, the market was very attractive. The, so these companies were very keen to enter Chinese government and the Chinese, uh, enter Chinese market and the Chinese government set these uh, um, uh, regulations, set these requirement. If you want to enter, you have to um, uh, transfer technology. And to a certain extent, the companies uh, were willing to uh, compromise. Um, well, they haven't really transferred the most core key or cutting edge technology to China. But yes, they have uh, transferred a lot of technology to China, which helped China develop in the past decades. To the some point that uh, the US was unhappy and some other Western countries were unhappy about these uh, um, uh, mandatory uh, uh, technology transfer. And that's why uh, Trump, uh, uh, the Trump administration complained a big time. And that's why uh, the US actually managed to convince China to remove mandatory uh, technology transfer. So China updated its uh, foreign investment law last year saying um, no administrative uh, bodies are allowed to force um, foreign companies to transfer technology. Um, it's still too early to tell whether this will be effective, whether this will make the US happy, but, um, uh, but yes, uh, the technology and the technology transfer is really a, uh, a center of uh, a discussion at the moment. Okay, yes. good. Thank you very much indeed. I have a, a number of questions popping up. People who are on Slido can also see there are four, three who get uh, the majority of the votes. So we'll do it just like the Euro European Song Festival. And the first question is put forward by Anonymous and it reads like this. What opportunities do you see for a European Chinese or even Sino-Dutch cooperation as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic on a business and a governmental level? Okay, we have to be very brief. Uh, Valerie, I think the business question is right for you because you're so much into it. Yes, well, what I actually see is um, uh, that we, uh, like having a Dutch brand is no longer uh, just a winning uh, factor. Uh, you have to really uh, have a strong USP and really distinguish yourself. Strong? Strong USP, like unique selling point. Okay, you have yes. to be uh, distinguishing yourself from, from local rivals, like Jua just pointed out, um, technology transfer is key. So we have to continue to invest and in, uh, to innovate. And I think uh, that is also um, very briefly to, to add uh, a, a huge difference. Chinese people are very proud of themselves. They're, that is also the nationalistic proud, but it's also a very strong driver. To, um, and I think we are t too humble. We should be very proud of our innovation, innovative mindset, uh, our creative mindset, and we should use it and continue to innovate, and then we can have huge added value in the long run as well. Okay, good. On a governmental level, I'm not quite sure, Dre, whether you would say, could say anything how the Dutch government could make better use of cooperation possibilities after Corona. Is there any point that you would like to make? Um, the, yeah, I think there are, well, the, the strength of what's happening already, right? There are a lot of uh, collaborations uh, in terms of trade, uh, bilateral, uh, uh, both way, and also um, the um, collaboration in um, uh, uh, biotechnology, in agriculture. Uh, the Wageningen University has a, um, a, a, a research center together with uh, China's biggest dairy um, pro, uh, dairy uh, factory. So that kind of technology-oriented collaboration. And also now, uh, since uh, the US is making China's technological development so difficult, um, the uh, SML has become a legendary name in the Chinese uh, uh, people's uh, mind now. So that this uh, amazing um, Dutch 
uh, technology uh, company? How how did they manage to create such success? So I think also the Chinese can also learn quite a lot in terms of advanced technology. So okay. I do say in terms of technology, um, or some traditional tra trade and the new trade area, um, I, I do see opportunities for collaboration. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Now I turn to another question. I think we answered part of this question. The question reads as follows. What do you think the learnings of COVID-19 are for Chinese economic policy? Localization? Well, I think we addressed that to a certain bit. But in the article, the next, uh, the, the second half reads, acquire targeted companies outside China for their technology. Now, we know that through the BRI, uh, uh, the BRI, the Belt Road Initiative, but also through other means, they have been doing that, uh, especially in the Netherlands and in other, and like Germany, they have been uh, trying to acquire high-tech technology uh, companies. Do you see that as a trend? Maybe you could say something about that, Stefan, as well? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of, uh, of, of the large, at least in the industry I am uh, active in, in ar architecture. Uh, you don't see necessarily, you see more architects from China trying to move in the European market yes. uh, with, with some success. The first Chinese are building uh, in Europe. Yeah, uh, this, this would really be about acquisition, so that they acquire companies so that they're no, no longer that much uh, uh, depending on what's built internally. Um, for the sectors I'm active in, I, I hardly uh, see it actually happening. Okay. Uh, though, I, yeah, I mean, I read the newspapers and you read yeah. of the interest, but uh, it doesn't go further than okay. that. Okay, 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 good. Now, now there are two questions posed by the same uh, uh, woman, uh, Frau Kje de Jong, on the migrant workers. And I think it's an important question because you see the problem also in other countries. The question is, will migrant workers return to the city? Is the general government encouraging them or just the opposite? Have you any idea what the position of these people is right now? I think it's difficult for the government to grasp those people, honestly. Um, they move from job to job uh, without uh, contracts. Um, that is why it's difficult to also pinpoint how many people are jobless at this stage. Um, so I think what the government is trying to do is to develop, and that's what, what Stefan is involved in, to develop the countryside. I'm also personally involved, for example, in a, in a project where uh, they're processing um, residue waste of, of uh, plant protection products. Um, and then I'm really in the middle of nowhere, somewhere in Heilongjiang, when it's like 30 below zero, um, between farmers, and they're innovating their area and trying to, to be the best within China. I think that is what the Chinese government is trying to stimulate, to not let the migrant workers come to the cities, but to develop the areas so the migrant workers want to stay in their own area. I think you would endorse that view. Yeah, a bit. And it's also backed up. Uh, we've been talking with people from Alibaba uh, in terms of how they see rural uh, urban migration. That it's a, it's, it's a dynamic process that basically some are, are indeed are really disgusted and unhappy with the cities and they turn to the countryside. Uh, if you become successful in the countryside, then they see another return to the city. So there's a, there's a huge interaction between the two of them and or even to have uh, multiple places where you live or where you work. That's becoming increasingly common also for yeah. my students in, in, in China. If you ask their parents, a normal, most of them sort of, and it's not that it's a specifically uh, well-established school, but they have you know, second properties, like they have a, a small apartment here and one in the countryside, yeah. and they kind of, they, they migrate. You also, there's a quite a low pension age in China. So when, for this class, it's really becoming more fluid, I would say, this urban rural uh, division, uh, division mm. uh, I would say. Yeah. And, and would that lead to a more even spreading of the income? Because that is another part of the question. Eventually, I, I, eventually, I think yes. Um, but I, in that sense, uh, where I, if you have, a, if you're talking about uh, USPs for Dutch uh, companies, or, or what does China need from Europe or for the rest of the world? It's uh, expertise in planning, also parts of these more like high level and also. Uh, more sophisticated next level uh, entertainment or new directions, new culture. And you see a lot of enthusiasm of reinventing their own culture, of really trying to also see what ingredients of the past are relevant and you can push into the future and really build something new. 
So I think that's the most exciting area for me to be uh, involved mm. in China in this moment. Okay, okay, thank you. I have a question for Dre, I think, here. Uh, the question reads as follows. Do you think we should prepare our students more for the future when China becomes a global power? Many students still have a view of China from 20 years ago. Now, since you are part of the Asian study uh, uh, department, uh, what is your what is your take of why people start studying China studies and how do Dutch students in general look uh, at China? Uh, well, yes, I, as, you, as I, uh, you said, I teach China studies in Leiden University, which is a, a, a long established China studies uh, uh, institute. We receive very bright students every year. Actually, um, many of them already have certain experience in China. They have a good understanding of China. Of course, we try to teach a very a comprehensive uh, uh, understanding of China from the pre-modern time to the uh, contemporary China. I teach contemporary Chinese economy. I try to update, um, try to teach them a um, more comprehensive role. Uh, comprehensive not in in the in the just simply uh, what's good, what's bad, but comprehensive also in terms of uh, um, what do a government look uh, look at China what do um, urban uh, a city um, sec uh, um, middle class people um, benefit or or from China's uh, um, economic uh, growth how are uh, working class Chinese people infected what does it mean for the rural uh, China so we try to make students understand different China because when we talk about China um, people many people imagine China is a big black box right like this big China machine um, this, the decisions are made centrally um, by the government but it's actually there are there are actually many different Chinas they have different view about uh, Ch their country and also they are uh, influenced by the economic political progress social progress of China in different ways so we try to uh, make our students understand different Chinas and different uh, aspects of China. Okay, thank you very much. There is one question that is uh, I find very intriguing because it's a question I put to myself many times, not only in China but other, other parts of the world. And it has to do with the demonstration yesterday at the Dam and the demonstration that's going on in Groningen and Rotterdam. And it's, uh, it's the following, and it's not for you, Jay. You may answer, but it's not for you. Do you feel more privileged when you're in China because you're white? Or do you think to, you have to put in an extra effort? And it's an intriguing question because one of the uh, China, um, uh, one of the most uh, knowledge pe knowledgeable people about China, Martin Jakes, I don't know whether you know him, but he's written a lot on China. And his wife is from the United States, and she's an Afro-American. And he has noticed every time and again that when they were traveling to China, that they were treated completely separately. Uh, but he has not attribu attributed that to the Chinese in general, but it has given him uh, a motive to reflect on how privileged you are when you are white and traveling around the world. So I wonder whether Stefan and Valerie have noticed the same? phenomenon occurring? I mean, are, are, you, are, are we privileged in China or the other way around? Are we seen as the former? I think uh, time has changed. Uh, when I uh, lived in China 2003, 2004, uh, and you would travel a little bit out of the big city, um, you would look at uh, as, as a god, godden, <laughs> goddess, what is the word? Um, uh, but now, honestly, um, uh, like the Chinese people are always very polite, right? They give you the feeling you're a queen, uh, but they're also very, very uh, proud uh, of themselves, zihao. Um, and uh, I like that word because it's, it's a very um, soft word for like some kind of an arrogance, uh, which I actually encourage because they are very proud of themselves and they know that in the end they will prevail. So uh, for me as a, as a foreigner, I know very well my place. Um, and sometimes it is a benefit because in, as a mediator in conflict situations, being a non-Chinese, I can act weird or ask inappropriate questions um, with the excuse of not understanding the situation. And uh, when you're a Chinese, you need to like, act as you're supposed to. So then it's a benefit. But um, you know, in, in the end, I'm not one of them. 
So in my business, I would say uh, I, I don't feel privileged. I'm just, um, I have great respect for how the Chinese people deal with such things as COVID and, and how they run their businesses. And I can only learn from them in that yeah. sense. Jay, has the uh, image of white people or Western people changed over the past two decades, let's say? I think um, Chinese uh, general public and uh, are become, especially in the uh, more open cities, more uh, bigger city, met more metropolitan cities, they are more and more used to um, uh, seeing foreigners. Uh, seeing um, uh, in the beginning, there were more uh, you know, Westerners, Caucasians, and now they see foreigners from uh, other parts of the world, from uh, South Asia, from Southeast Asia, from East Asia, from uh, Africa. So I think um, Chinese, Chinese people are becoming more used to seeing foreigners. Uh, of course, uh, there is still a lot to learn. Uh, Chinese people are trying to uh, learn more about foreigners, about their uh, culture. Um, uh, also, Chinese people are very um, curious. They travel a lot abroad as well. So I, I can't answer to the question whether, um, uh, because I never feel privileged as a white person in China. Right? So I, I can't answer to that question. But from Chinese people perspective, I do see um, people are more used to seeing um, a more international environment, are uh, more used to um, uh, uh, talking, uh, doing business, and dealing with foreigners in China. Okay, good. Thank you. We have to stop here. I'm very sorry because I get all kind of signals around the room <laughs> that are not feasible, seenable uh, to you, but visible to you. But uh, I can tell you. Okay, uh, let me uh, let me uh, start with thanking the audience at home because I don't know how many of you are still watching, uh, but I think it is quite an effort to do so. And oh, they're they're gone. The question, oh yeah, but you pointing at me that I, I really have to. Okay, one question, sorry, I mean, whoops, reverse, reverse. One question from the audience, who dares to speak out, raise her or his hand and ask a question that we all have been waiting for? Yes, somebody over here, please, sir. Yes, you should wait for the microphone, otherwise the people at home won't be able to hear you. Um, I was wondering for uh, Stephen and Valerie, for both of you, what we see very often nowadays is that mass media, media outlets, including the major media outlets, tend to portray China in a very black and white manner. And perhaps that is for the sake of efficiency, perhaps for the sake of um, s you know, simplifying the situation. But what we also know, as most of us sitting here, is that there are different layers of nuances, grey areas, different shades of grey, basically. Um, my question is for the two of you, and, and Drew, uh, well, wherever you are, um, She's still there. is uh, effectively, like, is there a way from your experiences for us to see these nuances more, um, for the, maybe even to promote these nuances more? Because these black and white, these contrasts, make it very difficult to see China for what it truly is. And we are you know, discussing the many modern faces of China mm -hmm. going into the future. It might be important to see these subtleties as well. So that's my question for all three of you. Uh, would you, before you answer, would you agree that tonight's meeting has contributed to bringing nuances, or so, yeah. okay, just just to check, just just to check, okay, okay, gotten very nervous. Okay, short answers. Uh, well, a few um, a million people normally go to the Guggenheim Museum, so that was at least one opportunity to uh, to give uh, uh, this type of extra image because indeed uh, I was following. Obviously, during the course of our research, also these tensions rose. So when we started, actually we started exactly on the day that Trump was inaugurated. I met Rem in Beijing and we were both baffled when we come out, came out of the plane. Um, and uh, obviously, indeed, it's been extremely frustrating how uh, American media and also the professional, let's say, the, the, the more uh, progressive media have still ha contributed to um, let's say only you need a, a single image, mostly. And uh, while you can have all your criticism that you want about China, please just try to diversify. Because if one, if COVID learned us one thing, is that China is not part is still is part of our world. It's very uh, much connected with us, and we just cannot just brush it away like with one thing. Ah, you're authoritarian, or you're this, or you're that. That just doesn't work anymore. 
Um, sorry, I'm going to speak to the microphone, so I can't see you. Um, but from from my perspective, as a, as a mediator in conflict situation, I enter a company when uh, uh, the management has has huge conflicts with their Chinese counterpart, uh, and all these conflicts, in my experience, arise from um, misassumptions, basically. So uh, people um, judge too early, and and they they really build entire strategies based on. Um, on, on non-information. So uh, from my perspective, the, the only thing I'm basically doing every day in my work is to help people listen and ask the right questions. And that's what I'm, I've been coming to China for 20 years, but I'm, I'm still, you know, discovering China. So uh, I think the only thing we should do is, is ask more questions to different people throughout society. And that, that is just very interesting and you never stop learning. Okay, good. Jay, I can I can speak from a you know educator's um, a perspective. So I would encourage my students and also you know whoever I speak with to identify uh, multiple Chinese actors, understanding different kind of Chinese actors' perspective, and then based on that, when you have more understanding of China's social environment or its history, its political characteristics, you understand how these different views and the perspective of different actors mix with each other, then that will help you understand why government, government, Chinese government make, makes certain uh, decisions instead of others and why it is different from uh, um, Western government or other uh, developing country government's uh, decisions um, in different uh, political um, uh, environment. So I think uh, what I do uh, is try to uh, make, um, encourage people to um, pay attention to more perspective, more actors, um, and that will bring the nuances. Okay, thank you very, very much. Thank you all, especially the people at home who now have gone to the vacuum cleaning, cleaning or whatever, <laughs> because we run out of time. I apologize to uh, the Bali and all you uh, here who are missing that uh, single train that is running. Uh, we run out of time for 25 minutes. I'm very sorry, but I hope you felt it was interesting enough to, uh, for, to, to spend your time listening and watching what uh, Dr. Wang Jue, Valerie Hooks and Stephen Petterman have told us this, uh, this, this, this evening in sharing their wisdom and experiences with, with regard to China with all of you. Thank you very, very, very much. And uh, give them a, you're not, we're not finished yet, but just let's give them a, a big hand. Okay. okay. from Klappe. The sound nice. of clapping, that's really uh, <laughs> fantastic. Some people are addicted to it, <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, before we really, uh, we withdraw to the bar with 1.5 meter distance, there will be no gathering around this table, uh, unfortunately. Normally we do that, but that, that's not not uh, not possible this, this time. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to the next meeting, which is planned for September 22nd. The ticket uh, is selling is open. We very much hope to be able to see see all the participants uh, physically, I mean, really being here, not doing things online, not that we mind doing things online, but there is a certain charm to be in an audience with, let's say, 80, 70 people, as much as we'll be able to fit here in under new regulations, especially since the topic of that evening will be politics in China. And it has been quite a rosy and optimistic uh, evening tonight. Um, I'm, not, I'm quite sure not everybody agrees with the content that has been exchanged here, but I can promise you that September the 22nd, when we talk about the political system in China, things will be quite different. Nevertheless, I hope to see many of you here again. Thank you very much to our speakers again. Thank you for the Bali for doing uh, the cooperation and uh, enjoy uh, the rest of the summer evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.